Now, I'm going to give a perspective this morning on why I think coronary bypass grafting remains the definitive treatment for most patients with multivessel and left main disease. Um, thank you. So I'll, I, I will start. I do have some conflicts of interest here, but the only one germane to this talk is the fact I was one of the guideline writers, as you'll hear subsequently, for the ESCEX committee, and I'm the chairman of the surgical committee of the XL trial. When we talk about stable coronary artery disease and the surgical approach, there are a number of general considerations we need to make. So I'm going to break my talk into five components. General comments about contemporary cabbage. Secondly, how most trials of PCI versus cabbage have been used to distort the cardiology literature. The evidence basis for cabbage, both in multivessel disease and in left main disease. And finally, what do the guidelines recommend? Now, the first thing to understand is that the results of contemporary coronary artery bypass grafting are excellent. This is the one-year result of the ART trial. I was a principal investigator when we randomized over 3,000 patients to single or bilateral internal mammary arteries, done in 28 centers in seven countries. But you can see the 30-day mortality was 1.2%, the one-year mortality 2.4%, and the one-year incidence of stroke, MI, and repeat revascularization all under 2%. And later this year, we will produce an interim five-year analysis of this trial. However, despite the excellent results of contemporary cabbage, it is still considerably disadvantaged when you compare it to PCI for three reasons. The first is that cabbage patients still have a low use of guideline-based medical therapy that reduces both short and long-term survival. While PCI uses the best available stents, cabbage often does not use the best available grafts. Most patients get a single arterial graft, being the internal mammary artery. And the short duration of follow-up of studies, we heard Dr. Hobson talking about a study with one-year outcome, always disadvantages cabbage because the benefits of cabbage continue to accrue with time. So if you look at this paper in circulation published in March of this year by the syntax investigators, they showed that one year after PCI or cabbage, only half the PCI patients were on optimal medical therapy, but only one quarter of cabbage patients were receiving optimal medical therapy in terms of aspirin, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and statins. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what the investigators showed was that suboptimal medical therapy re results in an increase in short-term mortality. And I would tell you today, if you have treated a patient with PCI or cabbage and you don't ensure the patient is on optimal medical therapy, that is effectively unethical treatment of a patient. The second thing that we've repeatedly shown in this analysis published in circulation, a meta-analysis of patients receiving single or bilateral mammary arteries with duration of follow-up of a minimum of nine years, a very significant survival advantage for patients receiving two mammary arteries rather than a single mammary artery. However, in contemporary practice today, fewer than 10% of patients in Europe and fewer than 5% in the United States actually get two mammary arteries. And the third thing is, is the importance of follow-up for patients. Because every single study shows that as you continue to compare and follow patients who have undergone either PCI or cabbage, the increasing duration of follow-up, you see an increasing divergence of survival curves out to beyond five years. So for people to quote trial results with one year follow-up is completely irresponsible. Now, if you look at the evidence basis for any intervention, and here we're going to compare PCI and cabbage, there are two forms of evidence we can consider. The randomized controlled trial is clearly the gold standard because it eliminates bias. But randomized trials have a lot of potential weaknesses. They often include only a small number of patients. They often only include a small percentage of the total eligible population. And therefore, the trials are often populated by an atypical patient population that doesn't represent real practice, as we heard in the COURAGE trial from Dr. Hobson. And the other problems with these some trials are short durations of follow-up, and then they're compounded by large numbers of crossovers, and trials are also very expensive to run. But these limitations I show you apply to 19 out of the 20 randomized trials of PCI versus cabbage. The other form of evidence that we can look at are propensity match registries. 
Now, the advantage of these are they often contain tens of thousands of patients and they represent what we actually do in everyday clinical practice. They're relatively cheap to run, but of course their major disadvantage is a potential for confounding by biases that we may know about or that we may not know about. But the two critical things always to consider when we're interpreting data is what was the percentage of eligible population actually enrolled into the trial and what was the duration of follow-up. Now in 2006, I was privileged to give this lecture to the STS, the Ferguson Lecture, and the title of my talk was Coronary Artery Bypass Grafting is still the best treatment for multivessel and left main disease, but patients need to know. And what I did in this lecture was I presented an analysis of the 15 trials of PCI versus cabbage that had been produced at that time, which all claimed that there was no difference between PCI and cabbage in terms of survival. And the point I made was, and it's summarized in the bottom of this slide, was that although these trials in total included around 9,000 patients, they'd only included 5% of the total population with multivessel disease. And if you look at the characteristics of the patients in the trial, for PCI, none had left main, only actually about 40% actually had proximal LAD disease, and only one-third had three-vessel disease. Whereas in everyday cabbage practice, over 20% of patients had left main disease, over 90% had three-vessel disease, and over 90% had proximal LAD disease. So the point I made was that the patients enrolled into these trials were totally different from the patients that we were operating on on a day-to-day -day basis. Nevertheless, the results of these trials were then generalized to the whole population of patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. But finally, there has now been one trial that has corrected all of this, and that is the Syntax trial. The one-year outcome was published in The Lancet in 2009 the five-year outcomes in 2013. Now, this was a landmark trial because it did two things that no trials had previously done. The first was it was a relative all-comer trial, so it didn't look for highly selected patient population. And in addition to producing the five-year outcomes of death and MACE, it also had a nested parallel registry. So it looked at what happened to those patients who were deemed, for whatever reason, ineligible for randomization, and what you can see is that one third of all patients went straight to the registry. And the vast majority of these patients did so because they required coronary artery bypass grafting because the disease was so severe, even aggressive interventional cardiologists did not feel these patients should be randomized. So when we show the results of the five year randomized component, remember they underestimate the true benefit of cabbage because they didn't include all those patients in the registry. But what did syntax shows at five years for patients with three-vessel disease? Well, it showed us very convincing results. It showed a highly significant reduction in mortality, cardiac death, myocardial infarction, composite endpoints, and repeat revascularization, all in favor of cabbage. And there was no significant difference in stroke between cabbage and PCI at five years. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by the five-year outcome of syntax because if we look at the numerous propensity match registries that existed in the literature, we'd known this was true for the previous 10 years. If you look at syntax according to the severity of patient scores, according to low, intermediate, or high-risk disease, you can see that it's only in the patients in the low-risk category, those with syntax scores below 23, where there was no difference between cabbage and PCI. But even in this group, cabbage still had a significant reduction in repeat revascularization. If you look at the intermediate and the high risk group, you see that cabbage resulted in a significant reduction in mortality of up to 10% and a marked reduction in myocardial infarction, repeat revascularization. And if you look at the survival of the patients out to five years, you can see that at five years, these survival curves are continuing to diverge suggesting that with further follow-up, you will see an even greater benefit of cabbage compared to stenting. Now, there have been several meta-analyses looking at the outcome of more randomized trials of PCI versus cabbage. This is an analysis in JAMA in 2013, looking at over 6,000 patients randomized to cabbage or PCI, showing a highly significant reduction in mortality at five years in favor of cabbage. And this is accompanied by a marked reduction in myocardial infarction, 
repeat revascularisation, and again, no significant difference in the risk of stroke for PCI and cabbage. If you look at patients with diabetes, we know from the original Barry trial published in Jack in 2007 that there was a 12% survival advantage for patients undergoing cabbage. If you look at a more recent meta-analysis by Halatke in The Lancet in 2009, they showed an almost 9% difference in favour of cabbage at seven years. And if you look at the more recent Freedom trial, the latest randomised trial again shows a significant reduction in mortality of over 5% in favour of cabbage at five years. But again, if you look at the survival curves, look how they continue to diverge at five years, suggesting that we're underestimating the true long-term benefit of bypass grafting. And there have been several meta-analyses done comparing cabbage and PCI in patients with diabetes, all consistently showing significant reduction in death, cardiac death, and repeat revascularization in favor of cabbage. And that the benefits of surgery, as I've repeatedly said, increase with the duration of follow-up. Now, if we look at the large propensity match registries that have been in the literature over the last decade, two from the New York registry, the assert registry of 190,000 patients, all of these registries have shown us over the last decade of the continuing divergence in survival in favour of cabbage with increasing duration of follow-up. And if you look at the ACERT registry, the most powerful of these, with 190,000 patients from both the ACC and STS databases, 80% of these patients received drug-eluting stents, but still we saw a continuing survival advantage with cabbage. And this registry is so powerful in terms of its size that if you break the data down according to patient age, above or below 75, gender, BMI, race, the presence or absence of diabetes, lung dysfunction, peripheral vascular disease, prior myocardial infarction, renal dysfunction, severity of LV impairment, overall risk, severity of coronary artery disease, every way you slice the data, you see a strong survival advantage for bypass grafting. And even the most recent or most modern generation of drug eluting stent, the Everall eluting stent, this is a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine about a month ago, the so-called BEST trial from SJ Park in Korea, showing that even with the use of these newer generation drug eluting stents, you still do not match the outcomes of bypass grafting. Now, admittedly, this was done only in very low risk patients. The mean syntax score was 23, but even so, there was still, even in this low risk group of patients, ever all of this looting stents did not match the results of coronary bypass grafting. And a similar study published in the same edition of the New England Journal of Medicine, almost 19,000 patients from a population of 116,000, they again showed no significant reduction in MACE in patients receiving ever all of this looting stents compared to bypass grafting. But the amazing thing to me about this, and I wrote to the editor to complain, was how they published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine with no syntax scores. So we don't even know what cohort of patients these were with coronary artery disease. Regrettably, they didn't publish my paper, my, my letter. Now here's the crucial point to understand today because this is the bit that most cardiologists don't understand and they don't get it. And it's why they keep saying, we've got a new stent, we've got a new stent. There's a fundamental difference between what bypass does and what stenting does. And it's because anatomically, atheroma is mainly located in the proximal coronary arteries. So when we do bypass grafting, we do two things. We place the bypass graft to the mid-coronary vessel, and that has two effects. It means no matter how complex the proximal lesion is, it's irrelevant. And it means also that over the longer term, the bypass graft to the mid-vessel helps protect that vessel if it develops more proximal disease. In contrast, PCI can only treat suitable localised proximal lesions, but it has no prophylactic benefit against the development of new disease. The second thing is the internal mammary artery. If you put an IMA on the LAD, it's been shown to elute nitric oxide into the coronary circulation and therefore prevents further development of disease in the LED territory. 
In contrast, if you put a drug eluting stent in the proximal LED, this impairs re-endothelialization, it causes downstream endothelial dysfunction, and it creates a pro-thrombotic environment. And the third reason is, for most patients, PCI means incomplete revascularization. This was shown by Hannon in circulation in 2006, that of almost 22,000 patients undergoing PCI, 70% had incomplete revascularization, and the subsequent mortality of patients correlated directly with the degree of incompleteness of revascularization. And this has now been shown again by the syntax investigators, showing that if you leave a patient with a residual syntax score above eight, you significantly increase these patients' mortality. So for these three th reasons, PCI is unlikely to ever match the results of cabbage for most patients with multivessel or left main disease. When plain old balloon angioplasty didn't work, the cardiologist said, it's because we didn't use bare metal stents. When they compared bare metal stents to cabbage and it didn't work, they said, it's because we didn't use drug eluting stents. And when they used drug eluting stents and compared it to cabbage, and cabbage was still superior, they then said, we used the wrong kind of drug eluting stent. But if you understand these three mechanisms, it's not the type of stent you're using because bypass is doing something totally different. Now, in the last 10 minutes, I want to go on and talk about left main stem stenosis because back in 2008, the established position, I co-authored this paper with several colleagues from Europe and the United States when we concluded that cabbage should remain the preferred revascularization treatment for most patients with left main disease. And we based that on two pathophysiological observations. Number one, up to 90% of left main lesions are distal bifurcation lesions, so we know that these are at high risk of stenosis. And secondly, up to 90% of patients with left main also have multivessel coronary artery disease, where there is already a survival benefit of cabbage independent of the presence of left main disease. However, when we saw the five-year outcomes of the syntax trial for patients with left main, we saw something that we didn't expect. In those 705 patients, what we found was that there was no difference in MACE or death or MI in favor of cabbage. What we did find was a significant reduction in repeat revascularization with cabbage, but also an increased risk of stroke. So what we see in the patients with left main is very different from what we saw in the patients with three vessel disease, where cabbage improved survival benefits and did not increase the risk of stroke. And then a second paper published in Jack in 2015, the pre-combat trial, again from SJ Parks Group, a randomized trial of 600 patients with left main, and it showed absolutely no difference in death, MI, or, or stroke between cabbage and PCI, but a marked reduction in repeat revascularization in favor of cabbage. And the authors pointed out that cabbage patients had received substantially inferior medical therapy. So if you look at the most definitive analysis of left main, 24 studies, 14,000 patients followed for five years, what we can see in comparing PCI to cabbage, no difference in death, with, in, with regards to PCI, an increased incidence of myocardial infarction for the first three years, a significant increase in the need for repeat revascularization with PCI throughout the five years of follow-up, but with cabbage, an increased incidence of stroke at one year and at five years, but almost certainly much of this difference in the incidence of stroke is because of the substantially inferior medical therapy in the cabbage patients. Now, what we also know is that the only benefit of cabbage in patients with left main are those with the so-called high tercile scores. That's the patients with syntax scores above 32. And the reason the syntax scores are above 32 is most of these patients also have significant coronary artery disease in addition to left main. And we saw this in the syntax trial at five years. If you look at the incidence of MACE in those patients with syntax scores above 33, it's very significantly higher in patients with PCI rather than cabbage. So why does cabbage not do so well for lower risk left main compared to three vessel disease? And the likely explanation is that if you have left main without additional proximal coronary artery disease, you probably have too much competitive flow and bypass grafts do not do so well. However, we will get a definite answer to this in two trials that have now recruited their patients, 
That is the Noble trial, who recruited 1,200 patients, and the XL trial, who have recruited almost uh, 3,000 patients. And the difference between these two trials is Noble did not have any exclusion. XL excluded patients with syntax scores above 33 because of the results of the syntax trial. However, these trials will both report in about 18 months, and these will give us a definite answer as to what the optimal treatment is in patients with left main who have syntax scores below 32. Are all left mains operable by cabbage? The answer is they are, but it depends what type of left main. In this first angiogram, you can see a complex left main equivalent with additional proximal coronary artery disease. So this patient would have a high syntax score. This patient would do very well with three bypass grafts. They should be all arterial grafts because there will not be much competitive flow. However, if we look at this patient with osteo left main, this patient would have a low syntax score. And the worry in this situation is when you put on bypass grafts, they may not do well, particularly arterial grafts, because there will be very significant competitive flow. And almost certainly, the Noble and XL trials will show that this cohort of patients are best treated with PCI. So what do the current guidelines recommend in 2014? You can see the indications for cabbage and PCI. But the major point and the take home message from this slide today is that as we practice today, if we look at patients with left main disease with scores above 32, they have a class one indication for cabbage and a class three indication for PCI, meaning class three means you shouldn't do it. And notice that two thirds of all patients with left main in contemporary practice have syntax scores above 32. If we turn to patients with three vessel disease, that's those with syntax scores above 23 or above 32, we can see that almost 80% of patients in contemporary practice fall into this category. They have a class one indication for cabbage and a class three indication for PCI. Again, bearing in mind class one means this is what you should do and class three means this is what you should not do. So to summarize and conclude, in today's practice for three vessel disease, almost 80% of patients with three vessel disease have a strong survival benefit with cabbage. It's apparent by three years, but continues to increase past five years. And this is consistent with evidence from 13 propensity match registries with over 430,000 patients of the survival benefit of cabbage over PCI. For patients with left main who have syntax scores above 32, this is about two thirds of all patients with left main. They do have a survival benefit with cabbage by five years, but they are at a higher risk of stroke and therefore the use of optimal medical therapy is absolutely vital in these patients. However, if you look at patients with left mains with syntax below 32, there is increasing evidence that PCI may produce at the very least equivalent results to cabbage, if indeed not superior results. And this may be because in this cohort of patients, cabbage patients are disadvantaged by competitive flow. However, we will get a defin definitive answer for this from the Noble and the XL trials. In today's practice, even although contemporary cabbage is superior to PCI for most patients, it could be even better because there is still considerable suboptimal medical therapy in patients undergoing cabbage, and there's failure to use more than a single arterial graft. And the final point I would make is comparisons of survival of PCI versus cabbage must have a minimum five year duration of follow up. Looking at one year outcomes can only be considered to be an interim analysis. And finally, for the surgeons in the audience, I would draw your attention to this conference that we're running in New York in a month or so, looking at a three day conference on every aspect of coronary artery bypass grafting from the surgical perspective. On that point, I'm going to conclude my talk. I would like to thank the organizers again for the great privilege of being here today and you, the audience, for your attention. Thank you.